man. Oh, man. Hello, everybody. I'm not sure I'm in the right screen spot because I'm in a new position, as you can't tell. Happy time of life. Hopefully it's a good time for you right now. Boogie here, and we're going to be doing ourselves a little bit of a, a planetarium drawing. And I've definitely upped our sound quality a bit from last week because we were using that. The poor headset mic is just not great. So we got clipped on again. And so even though I've taken off the space hoodie, I've got the space mask, I've got the space bandana, I've got the space pants, I've got space socks, we've even got a little bit of space underwear. We are lock and loaded. And so, in case you couldn't tell by the name of the title, we are going to be talking about the life and death of stars. And we're going to be doing some drawings to help illustrate it. And don't worry, I'm going to make it a bunch bigger. Like that. That's much better. Okay. Now, at any point, if you have any questions, feel free to just throw them at me. I don't have any flow that I'm so worried about that if you stop it, everything's going to end. It's fine. And don't text me, I'm busy. All right. So, to put a nice title on it, the... Yeah, it looks like a good size. Yeah, I like that. The life and the death of stars. Wham. Whoosh. Okay. Now, life is going to be the beginning of this whole story. Death is at the end. Okay, I'm going to shut up this phone because everyone's going to text me right now. Oh, look, he's on a stream. Let's text him. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, so at the very beginning of any star's life, you generally have a large ball of gas. We're gonna put some different colors in here. Let's say we got a little bit of this. We got ourselves a little bit of this. And we'll do one more. We got ourselves a little bit of this. This big old thing that we are going to call a nebula. We'll put a little more space in that. Let's get some better handwriting in here. Nebula. Within this nebula, which is just a big ball of different gases, mostly hydrogen, some helium, and it can be comprised of a bunch of heavier elements as well, depending on where it came from. If this big ball of gas actually came from the Big Bang, if it's one of the first progenitors of stars, it's gonna be mostly hydrogen. If it's coming from a bunch of other stars that have died, which we'll go over that in a little while, those remnants of stars can leave behind enough clouds of gas and dust, still mostly hydrogen, but oftentimes they'll be sprinkled in a little peppering of like iron and carbon and gold and other fun things like that. So in this nebula, we have little spots in which stars can be born. Now what has to happen for any star to be born at any, any given spot? So we have this big ball of gas. It's not very useful on its own. Like it's cool looking, like the pictures of any nebula, if you just like go, uh, search engine it, we won't say you have to Google, you can use Bing, whatever. <laughs> You'll see some very nice pictures of them. So they're cool looking, but in order to have a star, we need all of this to compress down. The more that this cloud compresses down, the more force there will be at its center in which it will squish together those hydrogen atoms until if we're lucky, it'll get to where it will fuse those hydrogen atoms together to fuse helium. And when you go through that process of hydrogen into helium, you release heat, which gives you our star. So luckily, even though this cloud is very spread out over up to light years of distance, which is pretty far, it takes a one beam of light an entire year to get across, which is pretty fast, or pretty far, excuse me, when you consider that the speed of light that's still in frame okay good is and i'm going to use fancy notation here just so it helps you get used to seeing it 3 e to the 8 kilometers per hour 
It might be kilometers per second. I have to double check that. We'll just put 3E8. <laughs> what the hell does 3E8 mean? Well, it's just a simpler version and I prefer this way. You may have seen this before if you remember, or if you're learning it right now in like high school or at various parts of your education. Three times 10 to the eighth, which is the exact same as three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Circles behind it, circles, zeros behind it. These all are showing the same thing. This gets summed down into an easier way of writing it here, and then an even easier way with the E. That big old E just stands for that times 10. I prefer it. If you don't like it, if you prefer the times 10, either way. But that's just in the way for now. So back to our nebula. So even though our nebula is comprised of, we'll just say in this case, just hydrogen, like it's just a big old messy soup of hydrogen, those hydrogen atoms still have gravity. You can imagine each little teeny tiny dot in here. Every little atom, every little piece of matter that has any mass is going to have some amount of gravity. Usually here in space, you know, it's got huge amounts of gravity when we're talking about like black holes or stars and stuff, but you and I have gravity, atoms have gravity, the bird outside your window that will stop squawking during the day, it has gravity, albeit the atoms, us and the bird have a much less than the stars and the black holes out there, but we still have it because our mass puts a small dent into space time. Another conversation for another day, but basically, just remember that anything with mass has gravity. So let's say this little guy right here, it's attracting this guy here. So they get closer together. This spot of hydrogen here, it's attracted to this spot here and they get attracted together. And then this spot here, and then this spot here, and then this spot here, and then this spot here. And they all start getting collided together and we get more of a ball like shape. So instead of having this big old soupy nebula, I super obnoxious. We're gonna have something a little bit more comprised down. we a little bit, still wonky for a second. And we'll just put it in more in a disc-like shape. The reason why it is a disc-like shape is because the cloud is not gonna be in a perfect symmetry of itself. If by some random chance, the atoms were all evenly spread out in a perfectly good circle, it would just collapse on down to a single point and it would start making the star there. But since it's inconsistent, there's gonna be larger groupings of atoms here, for example, and over here, and those are gonna to group together much harder and bring down the atoms that are here and the atoms that are here, for example, and give you a disc. It will oftentimes end up spinning too because some parts of it are gonna be just a little bit off kilter. You can imagine if there's one hydrogen atom here and one hydrogen atom here, and they get attracted to each other, but they barely miss. They can go right around each other and start to spin as they keep trying to get back at each other. Same thing's happening on a larger scale with the nebula. A lot of stuff trying to collide into a lot of stuff. It's not gonna be perfect straight lines. They're not gonna be dead on each other. So they're gonna miss a little bit and start to spin around. Giving us this disc here which I'm just putting in the various colors so you can see that there's stuff. There's just general stuff. In the middle there, we will have this big old ball of gas. Mostly hydrogen still, nothing's changed. We haven't added anything from this cloud here. It's just coming right down to our bolus. Now at this stage, we can call this more accurately a proto star. I'm gonna barely go over, that's fine. Proto just meaning before, early, first stages really. It's not quite a star yet because in order for any of us to consider it a star, it needs to be fusing hydrogen or some kind of fuel together in order to be releasing energy in the form of light and a lot of heat. And at that point, we can then call it a star. Right here, when we have just a bunch of the nebula from before collapsed down, it's pretty warm, oh, I'll give you that, but it's not quite fusing yet. We don't have enough of this material generated into a single spot enough to where it's compressing on itself to force those hydrogen atoms to really get to know each other and turn into helium and release energy. 
After so much time though, that cloud will keep on collapsing because we still have hydrogen, we still have mass, so we still have gravity. It's not going anywhere. So they're still attracting to each other. So we got spots here and here that wanna go into here and wanna go into here and everybody's trying to get closer to each other. Once you get to where you have nice clean hydrogen fusing into nice beautiful helium, you will then have a star. So what's happening is you have this entire ball that's pretty much, for our example here, only comprised of hydrogen. There is a small amount of helium at the very center from where our helium is being made. So here we finally have our star. So, once we have our star, there's about four different ways its life can go. Which we gotta erase a little bit here. And the only thing that changes, or really what dictates what happens to a star in its life, is what amount of mass does it have? How much stuff does it have? Not necessarily how, what, how big it is, which oftentimes we like to assume that the larger something is, the more massive it is. That's not always the case, especially out in space. If you're talking about here on Earth, I still wouldn't, I wouldn't fall too hard onto that. I'd let go of that thought. So, the scope of the masses, which will dictate the lives of our stars, are going to be in units based on our own sun's mass. So you can imagine we have one mass of the sun. That's all that little circle with the dot means, it's just of the sun. One mass of the sun. Up until then, you have basically, we'll go with 0.3 instead of writing a third. One third the mass of the sun, and smaller. We have eight times the mass of the sun, and we have 20 times the mass of the sun in those ballparks, or a little bit, a little bit off. There we go. <laughs> in that general scope. So, starting from the bottom, because it's least exciting, and we'll go all the way to the top. What happens if we have a star that ends up with only about a third of the mass of our own sun? It can be even less, but we're just gonna say at a nice clean 0.3 mass. So after that hydrogen cloud collapses down and we have our protostar and it finally starts giving off hydrogen in the helium, it's going to continue on with that whole process of taking hydrogen, fusing it into helium, and that's going to give us a bunch of heat, which I'm just going to put in the form of this delta sign. Or if you'd rather have it be spicy, we got like a bunch of spicy waves on that delta sign. It's on fire. Heat. We're getting a lot of heat because of this process. So you can imagine, let's change colors here, I'm tired of the black. Let's do bluey. So we gotta start, ooh, actually I shouldn't do that because it's gonna get confusing. Let's go with the pink. You'll see what I mean why that's confusing here in a moment. So we got this pinkish red color here. So in any star, doesn't matter the mass, there are two forces involved that are trying to coexist in order to keep this body alive. We can imagine we have our center point there. So the hydrogen, helium, makes heat. Heat likes to rise, and in this case, rise is from a standard from the center, meaning the heat is always trying to go out from the center and out to the outside at all points of it. So we go there, we go there, and we go there. The heat being generated in the middle is trying to radiate its way out so that, that those atoms in there can cool down. Because nothing in this universe likes to be in a high energy state, and so being heated up counts as being energized. And so, like when you hold on to a hot rock, it's because that rock that was sitting outside in the desert sun, for example, didn't like having all that energy from the sun. So it's trying to give it off, and that's in the form of heat. And when we touch it, we feel it, it's hot, we put it down, all that jazz. Same thing's happening here. The other part that's balancing off this heat is going to be the gravity of the star itself, which 
is all working together to make this into a sphere, thanks to there being enough stuff. Because you have atoms here and atoms here that are trying to attract each other, and so that's evened out. You have one there and one there. That evens out. Someone there and there. And you get the general point. There's just about always somebody on the opposite side that's attracted to you, if you're an atom, and your gravities are trying to say hi. Okay. So keeping this little diagram here, because it's nice and easy to continue off from there, low mass stars, these 0.3 of the mass of the sun, have a very simple life. All they pretty much do is fuse hydrogen into helium, and that's it. They don't really fuse much more. The trade-off to not having a lot of variety is they happen to live a really long time. These low mass stars, <laughs> Low mass have lives. How simple do I want? A heart. How many lives do they have? They have lives in the like trillions of years area. Long, long time. They love you long, long time. Why is that? Why do they get to live so long? It seems like such a strange amount of time. Like we talk about millions and billions all the time, but when trillions comes up, that's significant. <laughs> So the reason why these low mass stars can live for so long is because the entire body of the star is actually available to be used as fuel. We'll see later on, there's gonna be basically layerings that's gonna keep a star from being able to use all of its fuel. But in this case, everything's getting used up because it's a pretty hot star. It's giving off energy and heat. It is of a red color, which is of the coldest of the stars. More explained on that later. But is that just a right of temperature area to which any helium that's made in the core gets so hot that it kind of makes its way out towards the edge? Or any helium, excuse me, any hydrogen that was near the core that was getting a little bit hot is going to radiate out. Kind of like when you start a boiling pot of water, how the hot bubbles at the bottom make their way up to the surface because that's where it's cooler. They're actually convecting out. This whole entire star becomes a huge ball of convection. See that okay? I'm working on, a pra I'm practicing writing big. <laughs> it's going so well. So with the entire ball being a giant convection zone, anything that's too hot can work its way out. Anything that's too cold though, will be able to fall back down. Colder things want to fall, hotter things want to rise. And so the entire ball is constantly recycling its entire mass of hydrogen and helium. So you never get this huge grouping of helium right in the middle, which is a good thing. Because if this star is only large enough to have enough compressive force from its gravity, in order to only do hydrogen into helium, you don't want to keep helium stocked up in one spot. Because if you have just helium left over, you can't keep going. There's no more heat, and then the star dies. But since the hydrogen, any hydrogen that's sitting on the outside will simply just fall into the core because it's colder, you can use the whole ball of energy. The death of these stars isn't all too exciting. They basically just keep cycling through this whole thing until they slowly just fade away, until they just darken, and they're done. They don't do anything explosive. They don't have any cool effects afterwards. They just do their whole, they do the thing that they're made to do. They take hydrogen, fuse it into helium, and they keep doing it until they're done. That's it. Nice and simple on the low end. That is what we will call the low mass stars. And I need a little bit more water for my magic eraser. Oh my God, so much. Ew. All right. Now I had mentioned that the red stars are the coldest. And before I keep going on to high mass, I would might as well talk about the coloring of stars. Well, I guess I shouldn't say high mass because we're going to talk about our sun next, but no matter. So stars can be classified in all kinds of different ways, of course. But one way is based off of their temperature. 
and color, which are kind of linked together. You have this really strange, um, I don't want to call it an acronym, but it's kind of like that. And I'm going to write it backwards from what I'm saying. So O B A F G B A P K M and then it might be like TYL, I think. But that's less important. Don't worry about the TYL. This really strange lettering system here. MLTY. LTY. L. Yeah, appreciate that. I'm actually gonna. I didn't want to leave it because I didn't feel confident. But now I. Now that I got that. L. Oh jeez. Come on. Got all wet. Now he can't perform. <laughs> L, T, Y. For the most part, we're only going to really worry about from M up. But that's less important. So this ordering here is a remnant of an old classification system that has been adapted and such. And they like to keep, astronomers like to kind of keep with the old ways a little bit. And so there's a nice little way to remember this whole stretch of things. O, B, A, fine, girl, gal, or gelatinous humanoid, whatever you prefer, kiss me. Why the hell would you want to remember all that? It's because this whole stretch of letters is the classification for the temperatures of and colors, in a sense, of stars. So over at the O end, we have the largest mass stars that we can find. They really do suck at naming things. It's hilarious. I don't know how many times you like go through an astronomy class and you hear about the namings of things and you're like, what? Like, we could talk about an entire thing about the unfortunate dwarf labeling of everything because a lot of them were just like white dwarfs we can talk about later if we have time because they're white and small. Unfortunate, but that's how they named it. And there's worse ones. Not like in that sense, but there's just bad labeling everywhere. Anyway, O stars, large mass, happen to be on the blue side of things. M and LTY. Low mass happen to be on the red side of things. And if you know your rainbow, you got Roy, G, and Biv, but there's not really violet stars. Now you might be wondering, okay, so there's green stars, right? We're gonna be like right in this area, F and A, F and A. <laughs> green stars. Well, unfortunately, there are no green stars. Because our brains, slash our eyes, do not let us see it. For example, our sun, being a G-type star, which they can get more classified still by being like a G0, G1, G2, G0 being the most massive, or the, excuse me, well, sometimes the most massive, but that's more complicated, the hottest, of those G's, one is a little cooler, two is a little cooler, blah, blah, blah. So our sun, being a G-type star, is actually what I would consider to be a green star. Because we have our spectrum for our sun here. Been nice, make a nice little graph. And we've got, come on, buddy, you can, you can draw it. Roy, G, Biv. Roger, right, Biv. Yeah, that's not very dark. Damn thing's acting like it's all wet down here. <laughs> you can do it, little marker, buddy. I believe in you. Yeah. Roy. G. Bivo. Roger, right, Biv. And if you were to look at a spectrum from our sun, meaning if you had a device that could scan all of the wavelengths of light that were being emitted off of our sun and made a graph out of it and showed, hey, this is how much it's giving of red, this is how much it's giving of orange, this is how much it's giving of yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, all that jazz. You would find that it peaks in the green area. And the reason we're able to see any color of any object is because it will release a certain wavelength and others will be absorbed. The ones that are released from an object or reflected off of an object, like in this case, these colorful ass pants, 
And this spot right here, blue is reflecting off of it and going into your eyes. And this spot here, more of a red and purple, that's reflecting off and going into your eyes, and you're able to see it. So why is it that the sun gives off mostly green and we don't see it as a green star? Well, there's kind of two problems. The first one is being that whole brain eye thing I mentioned before. So when any star, including our own sun, gives off a majority of green, it also happens to give off a good little chunk of blue and a good little chunk of orange and yellow. And I don't really mean that that's good enough to where you would see it as blue and yellow. It's more that those even out. We have some blue and cool tones on one side, balancing out with the warm red tones on the other. And so our eyes kind of smash that together, or it's our brain, I'm not sure if which exactly. But in some process before our mentalness realizes what color that is, it will comprise those wavelengths together and make it appear white. So we have red stars, we have blue stars, and in the middle we have white stars, not green. This is unfortunate. And then there's more playing around the light of our own sun with our atmosphere, which if you, if you had come last week, you would have seen a little bit of that explanation. But basically our atmosphere takes the blue light, scatters it around everywhere, and with more of the cool tones stripped from a white star, you're left behind with the warmer oranges and yellows. So the sun, if you're ever gonna stare at it, which don't stare at it, damn it, it'll appear yellowish here on Earth. You go out into space, it looks more white, when it's actually supposed to be green. Kinda. So that is basically that whole thing. Blue, hot, we get the delineation of O, you cool down, B, A, F, and G, F, G area, you have middle temperature stars, which is gonna be white. K, M, middle T, Y, red, the coldest. Just a little, little side tangent there. Get this all erased. Now we'll talk about stars that have masses similar to our own sun. So basically in between the third and the eight. It doesn't have to be exactly at one mass of our own sun. It doesn't have to be exactly the same for it to go through this process. So, same thing as before, all the stars again started off the same way of having that nebula, that big ball of, or excuse me, that big cloud of gas collapse down into a protostar and eventually become a star later on. Jeez, this towel sucks at drying. Come on. Thank you. Right. So, this time around we got, oh, I need a different color. We'll go with green, you know, the sun's supposed to be green, we'll put green on there. There we go. Now with sun mass stars, solar mass stars in the area, 0.3 to 8, whatever, they will still be doing the same process at first of hydrogen going into helium, making some spicy heat. When they do that, in this case, since they have a little bit more mass, they keep things a little bit more contained, and they are able to collapse down all of their helium into a singular area, down into its core. As hydrogen gets fused together into... Ooh, hang on, I've got to stop and read this. 85% of stars are red dwarfs? I like that way of phrasing it. It's far from the average, but it's close to the median, which is interesting because our sun, which I don't know why people feel like they're on the losing team when they hear this, but our sun's pretty small, is what I'm gonna say. As far as the whole spectrum of things are concerned, it's on the smaller half. It's on the top side of small, but it's kind of small. It's relatively low mass, but with having just about all kinds of other stars, 85% being red dwarfs, which is much less mass. Even though our sun isn't the most massive, it's at least ahead of the pack. <laughs> so that's really cool. Thanks, Super, for that fact. I quite like that. Anyway, I was with the... Okay. Hydrogen is fusing into helium, and at this stage, for a second, not an actual second, but just for the second of our story, the helium is not being fused. So it's kind of sitting like soot in a fire. 
how you can put a log onto a fire and that will burn, and the ashes don't. They're not used up in the process to make heat. Same thing here. The helium counts as our ashes, and they're collapsing and collecting together down into a core. It will get to a point where our star, we'll just say our sun, is going to use up all of the helium, all of the hydrogen that is in its main core area. In order to try and fuse that helium together, it's going to get larger. And how it's going to get larger is because we have all this helium here that is not producing any heat. Well, less heat because it's not being used for this process. So instead of having this large amount of heat pushing out against the gravity, we suddenly have a lot less. With less outward force, we have more gravity pushing it in. So the core collapses down a little bit. When you do that though, when you, ever, you kind of constrict stuff together, they actually heat up. So it's kind of like a weird, negative feedback loop in a way. So we have less heat happening, so that means we get more gravity happening, which squishes the core down, which gives us more heat. If that core gets hot enough, it'll get to the point where it'll start to fuse helium together into things like, let's say, carbon, to keep it simple. Big ol' C equals spicy plus. More energy, more yum yum. get rid of these arrows here and so now we have a new core in a sense happening because now that we're able to fuse this hydrogen together or excuse me this helium together into carbon we're able to have a new core in the middle to which we have a new soot a new useless atom of being carbon and since we have more heat being used or being created thanks to that helium being used to make carbon, we're now able to fuse the hydrogen that was outside of the core and make even more energy. There's still gonna be chunks of hydrogen that are kind of stuck on the outside that are not gonna be able to convect their way down. It's too dense. There's too much of a plasma state in a way that will keep the cooler hydrogen from falling down just as we had the low mass stars doing. So there's a relatively finite amount of energy that any star at this stage and up can give because there's only so much fuel in any given zone. So we have our dead innate carbon now that's in the middle that's collecting together. We have the hydrogen fusing into helium just outside of that with the newfound heat that they got from the inside from the core with the hydrogen or the helium into carbon. And then you have the just sitting there being pretty and warm hydrogen sitting around. Not doing much, just being there. Now for these mass of stars in the one mass of the sun area, carbon's gonna be the end of the line. That's about all they're really gonna do at this point. And once they get to there, we are then gonna have a beautiful kind of release of things. So our sun, for example, is going to expand a huge amount when it goes into a red giant phase. Because when we had our sun before, fusing just hydrogen into helium, it was giving off a set amount of heat which balanced out its gravity to be, let's say, this size. When it was able to fuse helium into carbon, it's able to go to a larger size because it's giving off more energy, more heat, which is pushing out more against that gravity that is there. Now, when we have this carbon, that same process bef from before the helium is happening, to which we have the core being useless and not giving off any energy, which then allows for more gravity to come in to compress down on the core and heat that guy up, which is then going to cause the entire star to expand even more. And it will eventually get to a point where the outer layers are going to be too far away from the core in which the gravity will keep it all contained into a ball. It's often referred to as burping off the layers, whether you like that phrase or not. 
you can imagine there is our core in the middle that's just full of carbon and it's super hot giving off all of this energy and it's pushing off all these different layers of the star that were there and so this layer starts to leave and then this layer starts to leave and then the other layer starts to radiate out just because there's not enough gravity keeping it in. There's just a lot of heat pushing it out from all this compression. Not enough to fuse carbon into more atoms, but enough to where this large expanse kind of has to let go of itself. It's not as drastic of a supernova, which we'll talk about that here shortly, but these planetary nebulae are still nice. They still leave behind material that can be in the future used for stars or just make for pretty pictures. But what you get left behind with is a white dwarf. So once you have all those layers burped off from before, from all the super heat, you're then left with just this really tight ball that's just full pretty much of super hot carbon. Carbon that's been squished down so much from the star that was there and pretty much left alone. Once all the layers left, they're like, hey buddy, bye. Yeah, I'll never see you again. <laughs> He's left alone. Still super hot and relatively bright, but super small. Like we're talking about, mm, no, I'm not gonna say it because I'm thinking of the neutron star comparison. They're just much smaller than ours. The our, now, smaller. I'm gonna try and mess you up by doing a totally wrong comparison of size. White dwarfs, these guys here can also live for billions or trillions of years, similar to the red stars that we had before, the low mass. But in this case, you could kind of call our sun in this example dead. Because it's not doing what a star is supposed to do. It's not fusing things together and releasing heat. It's still releasing heat and light, uh, but there's a lot less mass, there's a lot less gravity. It wouldn't be the same. If our sun turned into a white dwarf right now, I mean, A, if we got to skip all the huge nasty processes of it getting large and baking us alive, that'd be cool. But what would be left, it wouldn't be as nice. Because since there's less gravity, Earth would go from being, let's say, right here. It would slowly start to move its way out into a much larger orbit, if it would even stay in orbit. It could be that the sun would then not have enough gravity to where everything would stay around it and we would just fly off into the abyss of space. Just cool? No, not cool. So that is the fate of the stellar mass stars in that area. So let's try and write down the deaths of these things as we go along, huh? And then dry it, all right, good. So with our really low mass stars, they basically just they burn forever. No, let's not say forever. Burn long time. And then fade away. They have really long lives. Boring deaths. Our stellar st size suns. Stars. Our sun type stars. Why do they are the size of the Earth? I was thinking that was neutron stars. But, hey. Okay. I'll take what you say. So white dwarfs would be like if you took our sun and all you got left with was the size of the earth. Huge difference. And then we got um, sun mass type stars. They have planetary nebulae as their deaths. Nebulae is just plural for nebula. Doesn't really matter. And they have, uh, what do I want to say? stereotypical lives like you can kind of compare other stars to the life of a sun kind of stereotypical life boring status quo <laughs> we get a little bit larger though and once we go from eight mass on that's when we can technically call these high mass high mass good to see you buddy hi <laughs> These are what we'll call high mass. The reason why we have them delineated off in two spots is you'll see here in a minute. So high mass star. 
Let's draw him in a, a blue, because he is a bluer star. Big boy here. Now, it's kind of situational. That's pretty much situational on how these different stars get to start off at different points. That's not just that one happens to be this, one happens to be that, one happens to be eight. It happens to be how much stuff was around and could collapse down fast enough during the nebula cloud at the very beginning. If there's a lot of stuff and it collapses down quickly before the energy churning mechanisms turn on, then you can have a really high mass star. The reason why I need it to happen fast enough is because let's say you have a big old cloud, but it's collapsing slow. If the middle happens to get to where there's enough energy in which it can ignite itself into a star, that heat is going to radiate all the extra crap that's around and make it to where that star can't get any bigger. So you need to have a little bit of a nice kind of speed, speed slam in order to get the higher mass stars. So with more stuff around, we have a higher mass. With more mass, more stuff, we have more gravity. With more gravity, we squish down things harder and they release a lot more energy, giving off a more blue tone to them. Now, where the low mass stars might live for like trillions of years, our sun might live for billions of years in the area of, I don't know what, 14 billion years? Mm ish, depending on where you want to cut off the line of death. 8, 20, the high mass stars, they're more like in the millions of years. Huge differences from trillions to millions. Would you rather live a trillion years or a million years? Maybe neither, but trillion sounds better. It's bigger. It's nicer. It's like, would you rather live for a hundred years or one year? A <laughs> hundred. <laughs> same sort of thing. So, same thing as before, we got hydrogen going into helium, and that's making some ooh spicy food. Giving us some heat. It will eventually do the same thing. It will turn helium into carbon, giving us spicy plus. And it'll do the same thing before. If it didn't have enough energy to squish down the helium right away, it'll get a little bit larger. That core will collapse down, get hotter, all that. So everything's the same. Nothing's different yet. What changes is now we can fuse that carbon and all kinds of other molecules together until we eventually go towards iron. What is iron? It's not PB, that's lead. Don't eat my peanut butter sandwich. I'm just gonna write out iron then. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Feh. That's right, thank you. Feh. All the way until second iron. At that point, that's like sour cream. That's not even spicy. You use sour cream to suck up spice. Like that's, this is the end. This is the death of a star. These high mass stars at least, which we should make sure that we make a little line so you know that. This is what we're talking about, not him. This one. <laughs> In any case, so we have at the center, this big old ball. Relatively speaking, when I say big and small, of course. Of iron in the middle. Then we have some, let's say, carbon around that. Then we have some helium around that. And then so we have some hydrogen around that. Now, we're going to have this weird kind of effect. Because iron does not fuse and release energy. It will actually suck up energy if you try to fuse it together which is not necessarily good if you want to keep the nice pretty ball of this star because that heat is the only thing that's counterbalancing any gravity this star has. So you have much less heat radiating out. You go from having, let's say, this big old arrow to much less, a little tiny guy. It starts sucking up the relative energy around. Then we have a bunch of gravity trying to collapse down in onto this core and you have this, do I have a couple of balls around? That would make things a lot easier. I don't think I do. I mean, I do, but I don't. <laughs> but you can imagine that we have a whole bunch of energy and mass getting ready to fall down. We have the outer layers collapsing on down, 
to the inner layers. And this is, I put this ground here for our ball diagram, but you can kind of imagine this is like the, the line for matter to exist. I'll talk about degeneracy in a minute, but. So we got all this outer energy that's gonna fall down onto the inner. The inner is collapsing down more and more thanks to it not having any heat and everything pressing down on it. It'll get to a point. We'll come over here, I extend my ground to where iron, the inner ball, is gonna hit its limit, hit the ground. The outer layers are gonna hit the core. And what happens when a ball hits a ball? Or like when you jump on a trampoline with a buddy and they jump just before you do and launch you out? Same sort of thing. We have our inner core here that then gets slammed down past Degeneracy, which we'll talk about here in a second. Degens. You can kind of see that. <laughs> and the outer layers go springy-doo. They go way out into space. And this is a very crude way of trying to show that a supernova is happening. All the layers are going to try and slam on down because there's a whole bunch of gravity from all that stuff being there and there's a lot less heat trying to push it out. They fall on in, they hit that core, they slam back out, and they cause a huge eruption, a huge explosion in all different directions. Now, stars can usually only make up to iron in their own cores, but we often get our heavier elements like gold and other shiny things like that. Thanks to this supernova phenomena, you can imagine, there will be some outer layers of the star just kind of hanging out. Just kind of there. Well, this ball, this, these other layers of the gases that hit the iron and are slamming on out, well, they all of a sudden are going, whoa, whoa, shit. When they come up to this guy here, to these other ones are just kind of chilling, they're just gonna slam right into there and push right up on it. It's kind of like if you're just like standing there waiting for the bus or you're like standing in the hallway and someone comes sprinting at you and they weigh like 300 pounds more than you. So they got a lot of energy behind them and they just slam right into your back. You're going to feel it. <laughs> These atoms are going to feel it. There's going to be enough energy into here that although there wasn't enough heat to fuse iron, let's say to gold, there's enough that we can make gold and shit out of here. So thank you, large mass stars, high mass stars. Let's say high mass, not large mass. High mass stars, because we wouldn't have all kinds of elements like the shiny gold, nickel, not nickel, silver. And if you pretty much talk about any periodic table atom that's beyond 26, a lot of it's thanks to supernova. So thank you. Once you have that supernova effect happen, which I should probably erase a few things because it's getting a little busy on here. Get rid of this. Now I get over this. Okay. Now this is where two different things can happen between the eight mass and the 20 mass. Plus, we should really put a plus over there. You can be bigger than 20. There's not a limit as far as 20 is concerned. There's definitely gonna be a limit, but it's not that. And you won't even see the plus, but it's there. <laughs> so, that line I had drawn before that was showing the, the end for which the core was collapsing down, and I had mentioned degeneracy. There are two different versions. In this case, oh, my legs are all stretched out. There is electron, and there's neutron degeneracy. Degeneracy. I'm pretty sure it's with an A. Degeneracy, which you kind of already know intrinsically with the electron degeneracy, and neutron will kind of make sense too, just off bat. But basically, we already know that when we have an atom that's comprised of, let's say, two protons and two neutrons, 
which A is helium. Hi, helium. It's going to then be surrounded by a cloud of electrons. They're not in perfect circles, always in the same spot. We're just going to say it's in a cloud. These electrons don't like to be near each other. They like to repel each other, which in relatively normal circumstances, that's more of a magnetism sort of thing. With degeneracy, and we have such a dense core happening, first when it comes to the white dwarf, second when it comes to a neutron star here on. We're gonna be collapsing these atoms down so much to where we're trying to force these electrons to get close to each other. These ones are this atom. We got another atom over here that's got some electrons that we're trying to squish together down more and more. And these electrons are not having it. They're not gonna let it happen. And assuming there's not enough energy, there's not enough collapsing happening, it won't happen. The mass will stay in the realm of regular mass, if we will, and it will just be a super dense material. That's where white dwarfs sit at. With our sun, that thing that's left behind, we just have super dense regular mass happening. The reason why I'm calling it regular mass is because it gets weird with neutron degeneracy here in a moment. But this is what's happening in the white dwarf. For our eight mass star, after it does its supernova, it's gonna go beyond even that, even beyond the electron degeneracy, and it's going to try and force the neutrons together, which might not seem like a bigger deal, because you're like, well, neutrons are neutral. They, sh they won't give a damn about it. Well, the problem is space. Not space as in astronomy space, but the emptiness that's in an atom. So with electron degeneracy, you have two atoms here that have however many electrons going around them, but are for the most part empty space. So even if you do get these to get right up next to each other, you still have all of this empty space. Like it's untapped potential in a sense. With neutron degeneracy, when you have enough force that you're able to squish these atoms together past to what the electrons can push out, but still keeping it to where the neutrons can push out, you then basically have like this grid. You can kind of think of it that way, where instead of each of these circles representing an entire atom and its electrons, these are just neutrons. Electrons get smashed into protons and lose their charge. And this is all simplification. And the neutrons are left behind, but really don't want to get squished together. It's hard to have something occupy the same exact spot. And so you just have this big giant thing of way compressed matter. Whereas one atom before might have taken up the entire space that let's say this whole grid of neutrons do. So when you do that, you get left behind with a neutron star, which is, I keep saying like regular mass and weird mass in a way. It's weird mass in the same, in the way that it doesn't act like other mass. And that's kind of for another day in a way, like that just off of looking at time. I still gotta talk about black holes. But just know that a neutron star is super dense, super hot, pretty bright. If they're weird, they can have super strong magnetic fields enough to where it could just tear you asunder. And you would not want to live anywhere near these guys, really. They still haven't quite gotten to where they're a black hole, but they are still a menace. Oh, well, I guess I don't really need this. Yeah. Electron degeneracy for a white dwarf. Neutron degeneracy for a neutron star slash pulsar slash magnetar, which the only difference between all those names is that you have a neutron star is the general term. You have pulsars, which is when a neutron star can have its magnetic field be blasting off all kinds of radiation. And let's say it's two pole areas, because if you imagine a, let's do a different color here, a magnetic field, it tends to have a weak spot in the sense right at the poles, an opening, if you will. And so whereas a lot of stuff might get caught into this and fall onto the neutron star, anything that's near the poles can just get flung right out. If this star happens to be spinning, which most of the time they are, 
Any star that had any kind of spinning before is going to be spinning more rapidly as a neutron star. Because you can imagine that like with ice skaters, when they start spinning, they might start off with their hands out wide and then as they bring it in, they spin faster. Same thing here. We have, get off the mic. We'll have our large mass star spinning, let's say one week for it to rotate around. But as it's gonna start to smallen, smallen's not the word I wanted, but it came out, to shrink. <laughs> We're gonna take the angular momentum and really speed up its spinning until maybe it takes more like days or even minutes or seconds for this thing to spin around. When this energy starts to spin around and we, that's a terrible eye drawing there. Let's go like this and this to show that this neutron star is spinning, this pulsar. And let's say you are sitting over here with your eyes viewing. There'll be times when the energy will come at this pole will point towards you and it'll come point towards you and it'll come point towards you and then come point towards you on a very cyclical matter a very precise timing of however many milliseconds seconds minutes it doesn't necessarily matter but having this energy coming at you at a very consistent time pulsing out your eyes will see this or your telescope more likely is going to see this stimuli consistently and pulses that's a pulsar and a magnetar is just a neutron star or pulsar. It just happens to have a really stupid amount of magnetic field. Like what did I hear the, the other day about magnetars? It'd be like enough, enough energy to where it could strip your credit card from like millions of kilometers away. Like that's nuts. Like just told, like you just walk by, you're relatively near one. <laughs> credit card's dead. <laughs> you just got stripped up everything. <laughs> That sucks. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna leave this here because it's gonna be useful for where we now talk about for our last stage. And I won't even have enough, well, whatever. If I feel like talking more, I'll talk more. I don't care. I'm in charge here. We're gonna talk about the 20 mass plus. And so let me write in the life and death. Um, so instead of saying they have a stereotypical life, they kind of end up being like jawbreakers. As far as if you look at like the picture I have here, uh, there's all kinds of different cores. That's kind of what these high mass stars do. They kind of look like jawbreakers in a way. And then they turn into neutron stars. Neutrons. Good enough. High mass stars, we like those. Why? Because supernova. Why? Why, what, what? Why supernova? And black holes. Same whole thing's happening in these higher mass stars. Nothing's changing from the eight mass area stars. Hydrogen, helium, helium, carbon, spicy, spicy plus. All the way down to feckin' iron, sour cream. You use that to cool down, not to heat up. Lose a lot of energy in the core, the whole outside slams down in the middle and then explodes out and then pew! We got a supernova making all kinds of molecules, atoms, jazz. Not really molecules, it's not stable enough for that. That would just shred any molecule. Making new atoms. What's different now is that we have enough energy to where we can collapse that neutron mess that you saw before, that grid, that neutron degeneracy, out the window. Enough compression is happening to where we go right past that. And we get ourselves a black hole. Now we have a black hole of, let's say, this big. That's the black hole itself. Outside of that is going to be our boundary line called the event horizon. This whole thing is what you will see as the black hole. The reason why I'm saying that middle is what is actually the black hole is because that core that we had before, that whole thing of iron, that got slammed down past neutron degeneracy, it's basically collapsing down into oblivion as far as our current understanding of black holes go. And so you have a large amount of mass collapsing down to essentially a point of no size. So it has infinite density. I hate the word infinite, but undefined in the large sense of density but it has an effect 
much larger than that. So the event horizon is going to be our boundary line for which light can escape. Or really, as far as you care, where you can escape. If we eventually learn how to make any kind of spacecraft or any devices that can go as fast as the speed of light, and currently uh, our laws of physics that we can understand and exploit won't let us go faster than the speed of light, you'll want to know where the event horizon is. So, the event horizon, why is it that that's where light can escape? So you have a super dense thing in the middle with a huge amount of gravity. Not so much that it's gonna just suck up the entire universe. Some people have problems with black holes. They think they're super scary, which they are. I mean, don't get near one at all. But they aren't just these doom machines out there that are, it's just a matter of time before we're all sucked into a black hole. That's one theory, but it's not that imminent. They're not that powerful. If our own sun turned into a black hole, which it never will, unless it somehow randomly collab collides with some big mass star, then technically it'd be that large mass, high mass star that's doing the black hole part, not our sun. But anyway, if we, re re if we replaced our sun with a black hole right in the middle of our solar system with the same amount of mass, which is the important part, nothing would happen as far as our orbits are concerned. We would obviously lose a lot of heat and energy and we would freeze to freaking death. But as far as Earth's orbit, so long as the sun would stay at the same mass as it was when it was a star, and as it is now as a black hole, nothing's gonna change. It's the same. The effects of a black hole are relatively close to it in which you need to be scared. They aren't far stretching. So, why is it that light can't escape? Well, let's take a little purple here. So space and time are woven together into this fabric, which is so conveniently called space-time. A theory created by Einstein himself, to which states that space and time are woven together and basically make up as this material that is just space itself. Like you look out into space, and you're not just looking out into emptiness that's filled with planets and such. You're looking at space-time. Any body, any object, which I now look like this is a terrible drawing. Like what, what's the cervix looking thing going on here? This isn't a physiology health ed class. We don't want, we don't need that. Let's just get, yeah. <laughs> um, like not much better, but uh, you get it. You get the idea. What was I saying before I started talking about cervix? Um, black holes and space time and, all oh, right. Any object that has any mass, meaning it will then have any gravity, has such gravity because it puts a dent into the space time fabric. Before, or even you now, might have a general conception of gravity being kind of like this invisible arm to which like the sun reaches out and holds onto the earth and that's why we stay in orbit. It's not so much that. It's more like if we put in a little divot there and a big divot there. We have our sun chilling in the middle there and we have big E earth right there. You can imagine just like when you're sitting on a trampoline and maybe some balls come on the trampoline and they fall in towards you or you put some heavy object onto the mat, on your bed, onto your mattress, and it starts to, excuse me, divot on in. Same sort of thing. The sun makes this big old divot in space time, and Earth just happens to be close enough to it, which this isn't a great drawing to show that, we'll just do a little slope. Ah, that's good. It's close enough to which it falls into that groove a bit, and just rides that ray, that kind of, it's kind of rimming the sun a little bit if you want, if you want to make it sexual, but <laughs> you can kind of imagine it that way. It's just riding along the edge. If it falls all the way down into the center, of course, that's when it's going to collapse into the sun. Same thing happens here with a black hole. Object comes chilling around, it starts moving towards a black hole, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. It gets too close and it falls into the space-time area hole left behind by the black hole. This area occupied by the black hole. 
because we'll erupt in a second. Now, with most objects like our sun or the earth, there is what is called an escape velocity, in which how fast any object needs to go, whether it's you, a rocket, or light, how fast it has to go in order to escape the clutches of any object's gravity. So like in the case of Earth, how fast does a rocket need to go before it leaves orbit and doesn't come back? Because if you go too slow, you'll just end up falling into the Earth or you'll just orbit around the Earth and not actually get to leave it. For Earth, you're talking about like 11 kilometers per second. For the sun, you're talking like 600 kilometers per second. And that fixes my number earlier about the speed of light, which I'm happy about. You need to have three E eight kilometers per second for escape velocity. If anybody remembers this number, strange little three E eight thing, which is just three times 10 to the eight. Same thing, just easier way of writing in my opinion. Just a nice quick E. That is the speed of light. So in order to escape from a black hole, you need to go faster than the speed of light. Because that is the boundary line. You can't just go, is it meters? Thank you. <laughs> Three E eight meters per second. <laughs> it's a huge difference. Are my other ones meters too? Is it 11 meters per second? I guess a kilometers per second is damn fast. Yeah, that, that sounds wrong. Right? Never pay attention to my units. <laughs> They're in, in the ballpark, but not very close. They're like in the outside stand. I'm not sure about those either. Okay. So we'll just put 11 units and 600 units. <laughs> 11 escape velocity units. <laughs> Earth is right. That's what I'm thinking is a kilometers per second. So we'll just stick with that. But 3 E8 meters per second. In any case. So you have to go faster than the speed of light to escape from a black hole. But no object does. Not even light. So if there's no light being emitted from this object, it appears to be dark. It appears to be black. So it is this hole that sucks in all light and all everything and looks black. We call it a black hole. You get too close to this object, what happens? Well, you know, you might have heard of that about that whole spaghettification thing, which is when you go to an Italian restaurant and you order spaghetti, but then the waiter spills it on you on accident. <laughs> Just kidding. Spaghettification, which I think is a fun term, is when, what color do we want our death dummy to be? Earth is right, sun is right. I was right. 600 kilometers per second. Okay. We're gonna put Cindy in this pink color right here. And let's say she's trying to stand right on the goddamn black hole because Cindy didn't go to school. She doesn't know. She thinks it's cool. Which it could be anybody. Replace the name and whoever you want to be there in case you want someone to just get spaghettified. So. Oh, she's so happy because she doesn't know what's happening. So with a black hole, and this usually happens on the smaller the black hole, the more of a spaghettification process there is, because again, the black hole is really at this point here, and gravity is more concerned about the distance between the center of objects, not how large they are in that sense. So if you had a larger black hole, you'd be extending this out further, and the effect of which I'm gonna show you is lessened, if it happens at all. So usually this happens with the smaller sized black holes for the spaghettification to really be exaggerated. But we have a certain amount of gravity that's happening at her feet because there's a distance of, yay, however far. X amount of units. We'll just call this X. And then to the head is another amount of distance, giving us a smaller amount of gravity, 
which you know you can say is like x plus 69 because that's that's righteous now gravity is concerned with the mass of the two objects and to make it simple the distance between them squared so although changing the mass of an object does have an effect on the gravity it is a much bigger deal to change the difference because instead of just multiplying it nice and easy so for example two a mass of two doesn't matter the units just two times another object of a mass of two if we keep that at a distance of let's say one which would be squared equals one so we'll get rid of that two we would then get the number four if we do let me try to figure out where to draw this <laughs> two times two gravity unit of four so four g's if you will and we change this to two squared that becomes four we suddenly have only one g worth of gravity terrible one g here oh, that's just terrible Whereas if you tried changing the mass of one of these, like let's say you went from, let's keep this four down the bottom, two times four, let's double the mass of one of those guys, but still divided by that same larger distance. Two times four is eight, divided by four, giving us two G, which is still less than what we had over here when we, had a smaller distance but somehow had smaller mass and that ended up being more gravity because the distance is more important in the sense that it has a larger influence on the whole deal so we increase the distance between the top of cindy's head and the black hole so there's going to be much less gravity here because of that with less gravity here and more gravity here there's enough of a discrepancy to which the feet get pulled right in and stretched away from her head. I don't know the way I said that. From her head. Like, it's no big deal. <laughs> She's just dying. <laughs> so the head gets left behind a little bit, still falling into the black hole in this scenario, but at a much slower rate. Her feet just going, woo, slam right in. And the head is being stretched out far behind. Still falling, but... Until she's only about like a few atoms thick. Like that is some angel hair pasta right there. That's that's not quite thick enough to be spaghetti, but, but you get the general idea. And we'll get rid of Cindy. And all this math. Bye, math. Thanks for your help, math, but we're good for now. Let's see, do I want to talk about... Yeah, I might as well. I'll talk about for a second the other weird thing about observers and venturing into a black hole and what the hell's happening and what would happen if you watch somebody fall into a black hole or what if you fell into a large black hole a more massive black hole and it didn't have that spaghettification process happening would you be okay would you make it well the fast answer is no you would not you would well we don't know where you'd make it to but there are i general idea and conception is that you wouldn't get to anything. Even if there is something cool inside of this event horizon or on the other side of a black hole, should a white hole exist, which is yet to be discerned. Hey, you probably wouldn't really survive this process. Because <laughs> there's a lot of heat and energy and all kinds of shit happening in here. So even if you did survive getting in, once you're in, shit show starts. <laughs> but that's besides the point for now. So let's say... Gotta fix my black hole, damn it. God damn it. You put like a drop of water on this magic eraser and it just spits all over. All right. So let's say you, super obnoxious, we'll throw you in here. Super is standing right here. And he's got like some sunglasses on 
because you know he knows that black holes could still be bright because they have all kinds of energy spinning around them and getting heated up and jazz he's smart he's prepared he's got his black hole glasses on he's cool super i on the other hand no, I'm not going to be so cool in this example. I'm going to be like, yeah, look at that black hole. I'm going to go swim. I'm going to swim in it. <laughs> so I'm going to go stand right next to him. <laughs> There's me. Long ass hair looking like Cindy. Me. And I'm just going to start walking. I'm going to walk on space. That's right. If I can draw myself to be this big compared to a black hole, I get to walk on space. So I'm walking towards space and Super here is watching me the entire time. He stays in one spot, watches me, and I'm continuously walking towards the black hole. We both happen to have watches on. Let's change color. Not that you'll really be able to see the watch probably from there, but you never know. We both have these watches on. Look at that. Look at that big ass watch has got on. And I'll put on a big ass like my entire sleeve is a watch. Entire clock. What a big boy. I wish this thing would stop falling. I haven't worn a watch since the pandemic started. Well, that's why our sense of time is all fucked up. <laughs> Cause you took your watch off. <laughs> all right. So let's say I start my walking at a nice clean high noon. We have our clock synchronized to earth. And we start at high noon. 12 p.m. Don't universal standard time. How about that? Just to be fancy. Starts at 12. Goes on. Some time goes on. <laughs> Excuse me. <All> right. <laughs> Gotta make a sneeze exaggerated. Let's say some time goes on and now I'm just like on top of the black hole. And I'm like, just about to jump in. Nope, I don't have sunglasses. I just have dumb eyes. Dumb eyes going blind. Ah. <laughs> I don't look good right there. <laughs> no matter. So at this point, at this point in time, we're going to say that Super's watch is going to be something more like 8 p.m. This is nowhere near, like, scientific as far as the adjustment in time, but it's just to prove a point. My clock, however, reads more like, let's change color so you can tell, so you know it's different. It's gonna read more like 2 p.m. The more gravity something has, the more mass that it has, the larger effect it has on space-time, giving it gravity. If it has a large effect on space-time, then it affects both space and time. Space, it gets the power of gravity. Time, it gets the power to slow it down, relative to if there was no mass around at all. So Super, being way out here, and being essentially next to no other massed objects, his time goes normal. This is what we're calling normal. Eight hours have passed. It took me a minute to walk over there, okay? It took a little while. He's got to pack lunch, he's fine. It took eight hours. Since I was continuously getting closer and closer to a really massive being that has a stupid amount of gravity and has a huge effect on space-time, it will actually slow down time for me because I am in that space-time realm, area, spot, whatever you wish to use as your word. Making it to where I have experienced only two hours of time, in a sense. Not that really I've only experienced two and he's experienced eight. Like we'll still feel this. Now, how do I want to phrase this? Not that we're gonna feel the same. It's a confusing concept. Hang on. I'm just gonna move on. You get the idea. High mass slows down time. <laughs> kind of broke me a bit on that, I dick. 
can't find the right words that I want to explain that. <laughs> but in any case, the other thing that's going to happen, so this bubble here being the event horizon still, I haven't crossed that yet. So Super can still see me. As I fall closer in, my light is going to be doing an interesting thing. So where before, let's say I'm wearing a really purple shirt and violet has a really short wavelength compared to other colors. So my purple shirt is popping off going towards super obnoxious. As I get closer to this black hole, however, my light is going to start getting stretched out. The wavelength is going to get longer to where suddenly now it looks like it's blue. To where suddenly, not really suddenly, and just over the course of me falling into the thing, it's going to look green. And then it would look, you know, yellow. And then it would look orange. And the overall goal that I'm looking for is red. It would get so stretched out that the light emitted off of me would look red. In fact, the entire body of me, not just my shirt, would appear more red because all the light that is trying to reflect off of me is also getting pulled into the black hole. And in trying to escape, it's gonna give off energy and then, of course, have a longer wavelength. I say, of course, because colors or any wavelength, whether it's violet, ultraviolet, red, or infrared, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. The longer the wavelength, the less energy. So radio with really long waves has way less energy than let's say gamma, which is sitting over here dancing around like an idiot with how short of its wavelengths are. So not only is time gonna be going by so much slower, that's what the difference is. That's where the slow comes in. So Super is looking at his clock and going, it's eight o'clock. Shit, I've been sitting here for a while. And when I first started off my walk, I was going all nice and jauntily and stuff. As I get closer to the black hole, time slows down relative to the standard, which in this case is super. This is where my explanation comes back. I'm glad I found it again. As I get closer to the black hole, time is gonna slow down. So it's going to appear to super as if I am walking slower and slower towards the black hole. I myself, I don't notice anything. I've been going, I've been going for eight hours straight. I'm just chugging along like some dumbass ready to swim in a black hole. <laughs> to me, it won't matter because the amount of space change, the time, space time change is like relative to myself. It's the same. It's fine. For super, since he's the standard, watching an object get affected by a super massive thing that's affecting space and time and is slowing down time. I will appear to both slow down and turn super red. Now, because of this whole thing and how slow I'm going to get and how red I'm going to get stretched out, super is actually never going to watch me fall into the black hole. It's going to appear to take forever or an undetermined amount of long time because A, I'm being slowed down. A, beyond not even just like this 8 p.m. to 2 p.m. thing. It's more like in the realm of which He's going to die before I get anywhere to where it doesn't even appear as though I'm even close to it. And my red light or any visible light that's emitted off of me is going to get stretched past even red, go into infrared, go into microwave and into radio, which no one can even see that with the naked eye. And so any observer, it doesn't have to be just super, can watch me, but they're never going to see me fall into the black hole. For me, it's going to happen in real time relative to my own watch to which it'll say 2 p.m. and I'll fall into the black hole, all things fine and dandy in that sense. I just fell into a black hole and probably died. But it all happened relatively the same way as I would expect. If I thought it took five minutes to fall into a black hole, it was five minutes for me. For Super, it might have been more like 500 years for that five minutes to pass by. Not exactly like that, but gets you a general idea. Okay. So enough of that mess of crap that black holes are. If you need a further explanation on anything or want me to re-try to explain something, you just say it. 
I'll do it. But let me write down the final life and death phrasing for our final part of our star. Z and we'll use the nice purple tone. So they are jawbreakers still. They have that same life as the other high mass stars. And then they just go black, go black hole. And that was a simplified version. Like we could have gotten more complicated on the processes that makes it to where hydrogen fusing into helium gives off heat. We could have talked a lot more about, in fact, we could have talked at all about like supergiants and hypergiants and those sort of things. We just kind of generally talked them more at the beginning that the star would enlarge in and such. But that gives you the general idea of the life and death of stars. Low mass in the realm of a third of the mass of the sun will burn for a long, long time, trillions of years area, and their death is fairly boring. They just kind of fade away. They just slowly start to, they just run out of fuel, really. They keep doing the same thing their entire lives. Hydrogen and helium, but their fuel is constantly being recycled into itself so they can keep going for a long time and just fade away. Stars like our own sun will have our stereotypical life in which they'll fuse hydrogen into helium. They'll later on eventually be able to do helium into carbon, stop at carbon, and once they get there, they're gonna then be able to burp off their layers, their outer layers, leaving behind a planetary nebula and a white dwarf. High mass stars in the eight mass of the sun area are gonna have the jawbreaker effect in which they have all kinds of different layers or cores. You're gonna have the core at the very center, which would be filled with iron, which would be surrounded by other atoms like carbon, which will get surrounded by others like helium, which gets surrounded by hydrogen. And when they get to a point where it's not fusing iron anymore, then those outer layers collapse on down, slam that core into itself, not so far as to get rid of the uh, neutron degeneracy. So we get this big ball of neutrons, which we call a neutron star. High mass on the 20 mass of the sun area, jawbreaker effect again. But we go past the neutron degeneracy, slam that whole core into a oblivion, and we get a supernova again and a black hole left behind. Any final questions on anything for the stars before I say, hallelujah, another stream done, we did it, let's go party. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. Ooh, 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 yeah. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. Ooh, ooh. Nice. Well, then I guess at that point, we are good. So I appreciate y'all for coming to see tonight's stream. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a thing or two. And if at any point you have any questions on anything space related, throw them my way. And I'll also be able to do a little bit of research before I answer your question if in case you want more accurate numbers. So I'm not just telling you uh, kilometers per second when it's actually meters per second. <laughs> but in any case, throw them my way if you got them. Thanks for coming by. Uh, we finished another successful week of our streams. I will hopefully see you again sometime next week when we start up again on Thursday for our Game of the Month Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. Friday for our drinking at, with guests, which will actually be my sister this upcoming Friday, which should be a fun time. No damn idea what we're going to be doing as our activity, but it should be fun. Come by, donate a dollar, and make us drink more. Saturday will be another poker night. Maybe. I might switch back to Jackbox. There we think and kind of let poker had its time, which we might do some jackbox again. And we'll come back for another planetarium type show on Sunday again. What will we talk about then? I don't know. Maybe we'll talk about like the different um, planets in our solar system and what makes them all different and all their characteristics. Such like that. But the next time I see you is the next time I do. I hope you have a wonderful time until then. Bye bye for now.